Do you need to pass GED math? Well, if you're like most GED test takers, then you've heard by now that there are going to be questions on GED math that you can't use a calculator for. But maybe you're feeling a little bit nervous about those questions, or you're just not sure what to expect. But in this video, I'm going to teach you some of the most common strategies that are easy to use to get GED no calculator questions right. So let's get started. Okay, so the first question, what is the value of the expression for parenthesis 3x plus y parenthesis plus parenthesis 4 minus x parenthesis squared when x equals 2 and y equals 1. So go ahead, pause the video, try this problem out, and remember, try it without a calculator, and then we'll go over how to do it. Okay, so let's go over this question here. Now, there's one thing that I want you to realize right off the bat. And so that's when it says here that x equals 2, all that means is that everywhere in the question where you see an x, you're just going to replace that with a 2. And everywhere in the question where you see a y, you just have to replace that with 1. So let me rewrite this question after I replace x with 2 and y with 1. Okay, so I rewrote this now, and this says 3 times 2 plus 1, and in this parenthesis we have 4 minus 2 squared. So that's the first step. And now the next thing that I want you to understand is the order of operations rules. Now, these rules are very, very important for the no calculator questions, but really for the whole test. So you may have come across this, this word PEMDAS before and you're studying, and if not, that's okay too. But basically what it stands for, each of the letters here in this phrase, they stand for a different operation. All right, so for example, P stands for parentheses, E stands for exponents and square roots, M is for multiplication, D for division, A is for addition, and then S is for subtraction. So basically, when you see a problem like this, how do you know whether to start with 4 minus 2, or should you try to do an addition, or do 4 times something, or start with this exponent here? Well, the way that we know where to start is by following the order of operations rules, right? So this just tells us, this PEM does here, this just tells us the order that we want to do the operations in. And a way to remember this, it's an old saying that I learned in school, it goes, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, or you can just remember the word PEM does. And I have multiple videos on this on my channel, so if you want a more in-depth explanation on this, you can check out in the description down below, there'll be a link to that video. But the idea here is that we want to start by solving what's inside the parentheses first. So let's look at what's inside of the parentheses first, right? So let's start with what's under this parentheses here. So 3 times 2 is just 6, right? So 3 times 2 is 6. And then plus 1 will give us 7. So we can rewrite that as just 4 times 7. All right, so we have 4 times 7 plus. Now let's rewrite this. So let's look at what's in the parentheses here and do that. So 4 minus 2, that equals 2. So now we can rewrite this again. We'll keep the 2 in the parentheses as 2 squared. So we have 4 times 7 plus 2 squared. So we have our parentheses straightened out. And by parentheses, we mean what's inside of our parentheses, right? Now we want to look at our exponent next. So 2 squared is 4. So let me rewrite that as 4. And let's bring 4 times 7 down. And so what's next? Am I going to do the multiplication first? Or am I going to do the addition first? Well, let's look at our rules here, right? So we took care of what's inside the parentheses. We took care of the exponents. So next would come multiplication. So 4 times 7 is 28. Right, and that's just something that you'll want to memorize. So you'll want to memorize your basic multiplication times tables, but just know for right now that 4 times 7 is 28. So we rewrite that 28 plus 4. All right, so now all that's left is addition. So we don't have, we did our multiplication, we don't have any division, and we don't have any more subtraction, so we just have our addition left here. So we do 28 plus 4, and if you want to, you can even rewrite it like this maybe, because some people, it's helpful sometimes to kind of write, write it this way rather than horizontally, but however you want to do it. So 
Uh, one way to do this is just kind of do it just old fashioned, just do it with your hands, right? So start with 28 and then you go count four on your fingers, 29, 30, 31, 32, right? So I put up four fingers, that gets me to 32. And I know that's kind of a silly way to do it, right? Going back to going back to like first or second grade, but you know, you gotta get the right answer. So do whatever's gonna work to get the right answer so you can pass the test and move on and get it behind you. So the correct answer here is C, 32. All right, question number two. Janet borrowed $600 from her best friend for six months. She agreed to pay simple interest at the annual rate of 5%, including interest and principal. How much will Janet have paid her best friend after six months have passed? And let me help you out. Let me give you the formula here for this. And for any simple interest question, you will not have to memorize this formula, but let me write it out anyway for you here. So it's I equals P or T and so you can go ahead and pause the video and try this out and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go over this question. Now, let me explain to you what P or T means here in the simple interest formula. Now, P stands for principal, which is just a fancy way of saying the amount of money that we're starting with, right? And so R is the interest rate. And what you wanna remember is that in a simple interest question for the GED test, we're always talking about interest rate per year. And T stands for time. And again, for the GED, always think of time in years, right? So knowing this, now we can go ahead and solve the question. So they want us to figure out, including the interest in principle, how much will she have paid her best friend after six months? So let's go ahead, we'll use the formula here, we'll plug the numbers in and we'll find that interest. So she borrows 600, so 600, that's the amount that she's initially borrowing. So that's our starting amount. So that's going to be our principal. So let me put the formula here. So interest equals 600. And now let's talk about R, right? So the rate, we said that's always in years. And it says here that she agreed to pay simple interest at the annual rate of 5%. So remember now, we won't be able to use our calculator for this question, obviously. So what do I do with this 5%? Well, there's two different ways to write 5%. So the first way would be to write it as a decimal. So 5% as a decimal, you would just write 0 0.05. And if you were able to use your calculator for this question, probably the fastest way to do it would just be to use 0 0.05 and put that in your calculator. But Instead, what I would rather see you do here is use fractions, right? So percent literally means per 100. So 0 0.05, we can write that as five divided by 100, right? Because again, percent means per 100. So these are just a couple different ways of writing 5%. So again, as a decimal, 5% is equal to 0 0.05 and that as a fraction is five over 100. And we could simplify this down even further, but we'll just leave it as five over 100 for right now. So let me write that in for our into the question. So we have five over 100. And in just a minute, you're gonna see why I recommend for a no calculator question to use the fraction rather than the decimal. Um, and so the la lastly, we have our T here. So it says here that we're looking at a six month time frame. So remember that T is always in terms of years and six months is half of a year. So we can just put half, right? One over two. Now, alternatively, you could know that half is equal to 0.5, right? So that's just another thing that's good to know for your test. The fraction one half is also equal to 0.5. And again, though, for a no calculator question, I would usually stick to fractions. I think it's a little bit easier than decimals for most people, but then again, you've got to do whatever's gonna work for you. But now let me show you why I think fractions are the best way to do a question like this. And here's why. Because we have 600 and we have these zeros here, right? And since we've got 600 and we're dividing by 100, we can just cancel those zeros out which makes this work out really nicely because now all we have to do is six times five, which is 30, and then we'll have to divide by two. 
So 30 divided by 2 is just 15. And so rather than having to do something really complex like 600 times 5 divided by 100 divided by 2 or something like that, which would just give us 15 anyway, just by knowing that we can cancel these zeros out, it's a lot simpler, it, it goes a lot more smoothly. And if you're not sure about this trick here where I cross the zeros out and you want to learn more about simplifying fractions and, and tricks like this, I've got a video on simplifying fractions, so I'll put a link to that down below as well. But we've just calculated that i is equal to 15. So the interest is 15, and somebody out there watching this video, you might have thought that B was the correct answer. And if you did that, give yourself a pat on the back for being close, because you're really on the right track if you got 15. Um, but there's one more step here that we have to have to do, because it says it's asking including interest in the principal. So if you got to 15, you did a really good job by getting to 15, but you have to remember that it's also asking about the principal. And I'll admit I forgot to do that before. There was another video where I was teaching a simple interest question one time and I published it and I forgot, I fell for the same trick here that you know I was showing you here in this question. I forgot to add the principal and I published the video and I had to explain in the comments that I put the wrong answer in the video. So, uh, you know, don't, don't fall for that trick and I'll admit I fell for that trick before in my own question. So what we're doing here though, we're going to take that 15 and we have to add that to our principal, right? So we're just doing 15 plus 600 and the answer is just 615. So the final answer here is C. So if you got that question right, awesome. That's a tricky question. Um, if not though, congratulate yourself just for being here and hopefully this was helpful for you. Here are some of my written notes on simple interest. So if you wanna get these notes, you can pause the video. You can write these notes down and take your time with it if you want to. And just note that this is the exact same formula. I just typed it in lowercase letters here, but it means the same thing. But you can take your time with this, pause the video, and then when you're ready, let's move on to the next question. Okay, question number three. So number three says to multiply these numbers and round your answer to the nearest hundredth. 5.23 times 4.2. So go ahead, you know the drill by now. Try this out and then we'll go over it. All right, so for a question like this, I would recommend to write the numbers one on top of the other. And so let me do that here. Now, the best advice I have for a question like this is to not worry about the decimal until the final step. And then I'll show you how to do that. So let's ignore the decimal in our work here. And so we've got 5.23 times 4.2. And so let me make that line a little bit straighter here. And so now the way that we would do this is we're going to start with this 2 here. And we're going to do 2 times 3. So 2 times 3 is 6. Then we do 2 times 2, which is 4. Now we do 2 times 5, which is 10. Now, like I said, don't worry about this decimal point yet. We're just going to leave it out as we do the steps of the question, and then we'll, we'll deal with it at the end. So don't worry. We'll come back to that. Okay. So now we have to add a zero down here. So just remember that we put the zero down here, and then we're going to do the same thing with 4 now. So we do 4 times 3, which is 12. So we put a 2 down here. And what happens with the 1? Well, we're going to carry that 1, so we put the 1 on top of our 2 here. Now this time when we do 4 times 2, we're going to add 1. So we do 4 times 2, which is 8, plus 1, which gives us 9. Now we just do 4 times 5, which is 20. All right, and, and still, we're not going to worry about the decimal yet. We'll add that back in at the end. Because now what we want to do is we want to add the top row to the bottom row down here. Right, so 6 plus 0 is 6. 4 plus 2 is 6. And what about 0 plus 9? Well, that is just 9. What about 1 plus 0? That's just 1. And then our 2, we just pull that right down. So now it's time to go back and we'll deal with the decimals. So the trick here is to look at the original question. We've got 5.23 and 4.2. Now let's count how many decimals, how many numbers show up to the right of the decimals, right? So this is our decimal and we see two numbers to the right of it. And then we also have a decimal in 4.2. 
We've got one number to the right of it, so we count one, two, three. So we know that in our answer choice, right, so let's go, we have to start here, so start at the end of the number on the right, and you just count over one, two, three places, and this tells you where the decimal point would go. So the answer would be 21.966. Now I know it says to round to the nearest hundredth, but in this case, we don't really need to because it's multiple choice and 21.966 is really close to 21.97. But let's just say, assume that this wasn't a multiple choice answer question for a second, because not every single question will be multiple choice, right? You might have to, you might have to come up with it without multiple choice. So how would you know to round this to the nearest hundredth? Well, what you need to understand here is the place values to the right of our decimal point. So nine is the tenths place, six is the hundredths place, and this six is in the thousandths place. Now, to round, we know that it's asking us to round the answer to the nearest hundredth. So we want to focus on the six here that's in the hundredth place, right? Now look to the number to the right of it. And if the number to the right of it is five or greater, that means that we have to bump this six up to a seven. Now in this case, so again, start with the number in the hundredth place, look to the number to the right of it, which is six. So that's greater than five, so if it's five or greater, we're gonna bump this six up to seven. So that's why the answer is 21.97. All right, the next question says, which of the following is equal to the expression below? Parenthesis two x plus three y, parenthesis, times parentheses 2x minus 6y parentheses. So go ahead, try this out, and then as always, we'll go over it. Okay, so hopefully you had a chance to try this question. And as with all of these questions, there's a trick to getting this question right. And if you know the trick, you're probably gonna get the question right, or at least have a good shot at it. And if you don't know the trick, then it's gonna be hard to get the right answer. So the trick here is what we call the FOIL method. Now, first, the F stands for first, O stands for outer, I stands for inner, and L stands for last. And as always, I have other videos that I talk about FOIL more in depth in which I'll link to down below, but that's what we have to do to get this question right. So if you're not familiar with the FOIL method, then you're gonna learn right now. So, so we wanna start with the first term in each set of our parentheses, right? So in this case, we've got two X and two X. So we wanna multiply them together first, all right? And so what we do here is we're going to take the twos and we just multiply them. So two times two is four. Now, what about our X's here? Well, X times X is X squared. All right, so when we do first, we end up with four X squared. So let me cross our F out here, and let me delete this here, right. Now, the next step is O, so outer. So now what I wanna do is I wanna take the first term, and we're gonna multiply that with the outermost term, which is this six Y here. And I want you to note that there's a minus, so we wanna look at this two X minus six Y, keep this minus sign in mind here. So we do our multiplication. Again, let's look at the coefficients here. So two times six is 12. And remember to bring that minus sign along. So we've got 12. Now, what do we do with the x, y? Well, we just can leave that as x times y. All right, and so that's gonna take care of our outer. So what's next? Well, we know from the FOIL method that it's gonna be the inner. So what we want to do now, let's look at our innermost terms. So we have 3y and 2x. So these are the innermost terms. So let's multiply these together. Now, let's look at the coefficients first. And the coefficient, that's just the, the number in front here. So we see this 2x, for example. When I say coefficient, that's just a fancy way of saying the number that's in front of the letter. So don't be confused. That's just a fancy math way of saying it. And so again, as we go through the inner, the I step in the FOIL method, what we're doing here is we're multiplying 3y and 2x. And the coefficients, that's just a fancy way of saying the 3 and the 2. So let's multiply three and two together, and that gives us six. 
All right, so we're gonna add six on here. Now, again, we're just gonna have y and x. They're gonna come along for the ride. So we'll just put the y and the x here. All right, so that's going to take care of the inner. All right, and so now what do we have left? Well, we have the L left in it that is for last. So what's last here? Well, last are the two numbers that we haven't multiplied together yet. So in that case, it's gonna be our three Y and this minus six Y, right? So again, let's look at the coefficient and coefficient, again, just a fancy way of saying the number that's in front of the letter. So let's do three times six, which is 18. And I like to think of it as just bringing that minus along. And let's see here, let me pull myself out of the way just a little bit here, give us a little more room to write. So we have minus 18 and we have y times y, which is just gonna give us y squared. Okay, so now we're almost done here, but there's one simplification step we can do, right? So we've got this minus 12xy plus 6yx. So for our purposes here, I know it says xy and this says yx, but we can, uh, we can treat them, we could just as easily have written this as 6xy. All right, so the order of the y and the x here, they don't really matter. But what we're gonna do here is we see that we've got this minus 12 and the six. All right, and we can actually add these together. So negative 12 plus six is gonna be minus six. All right, so the answer would be four x squared minus six x y minus 18 y squared. And like I said, you could, if you wanted to, you could write that as six y x instead of six x y. It's gonna give you the same answer one way or the other, however you look at it here. And so, uh, actually this answer right here, B is the correct answer. So B is the right answer here. So if you got that right, then awesome job. If not, hopefully you learned something from this. Okay, next question says, if x squared equals 25, what does x equal? So go ahead and try this out by pausing the video and we'll go over how to do it. All right, so essentially what we have here, we've got x squared equals 25 and we're trying to find the value of x. And a really, really common mistake that I see a lot of students make for some reason is in order to get x, they think that what they have to do is take 25 and square it. And if you do that, you'll get 625. So if you made this mistake, then don't worry about it for today. Just know that that's actually the incorrect way to do this. So if you got answer B, it's probably because you took 25 and you squared it. But just know that that's actually an incorrect approach. I like the thought process, but we have to do things a little bit differently to get the answer. So what we do, since we've got X squared and we just want to get X, so we have to take the square root Right, so if you take the square root of x squared, you just get out x. So whatever you do to one side in math, you always have to do to the other. So if we take the square root of x squared, we also have to take the square root of 25. Now, that's just something that you'll have to memorize, uh, that the square root of 25 is five. Now, in another video, which I'll link to down below, I talk more about square roots, power rules, that type of thing, but I talk about all of the, I give you a big list of all of the square root values that you should memorize if you wanna get a high score. Uh, really, to pass, you should memorize those two, but uh, particularly if you're trying to get a really high score, you'll wanna memorize those, but just note that the square root of 25 is five. So that's something you'll just want to memorize for sure. And again, in that other video, I've got a list of all of the square root values that you should memorize. So the answer to five is just simply C. Okay, next question. I believe we're up to, up to six now. And this one says, which value of X will make the equation true? And we see X squared equals square root of 25. So this is a really good chance to see if you understand the concept that we were just talking about in the last question. So go ahead now, pause the video, try this one out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go over this question. What we should remember from the last question is that the square root of 25 just equals five, right? So right off the bat, we can rewrite this as X squared equals five. Now, what we have to note here is that we don't want to find x squared, right? We need to find x. So hopefully you'll remember from the last question that whenever we see x squared and we just want to get x, what we need to do is take the square root, 
is remember, the square root of x squared is just going to give you x. And whatever you do to one side in math, you always have to do it to the other side, right? So if we take the square root of x squared, we also have to take the square root of 5. All right, so square root of x squared gives, gives us x. And without a calculator, we can't figure out what the square root of 5 is. So we just leave that as square root of 5. And A is the correct answer here. So just contrast that, right? There are some numbers like square root of 25 that just give us a really nice number like 5. But there are other numbers like the square root of 5, and that's going to give you a, a strange number. And it's going to have you know decimal points and decimal place values after it. Right, and you wouldn't be able to figure that out without your calculator. So that's why we just leave it as square root of five. All right, we're up to question number 59. So 59 says, okay, I'm just kidding. This isn't really number 59. It says 59 because I pulled this out of one of my math eBooks here that I wrote. So that's why it says 59 because I copied it over here. So ignore that number here, um, but it's just the next question on this quiz. And it says, answer without a calculator, square root of 32 is equal to what? Now, I gave you this list here. I decided I'd show you some of these common square roots in this table here. And you might want to even pause the video and copy these down into your notes. That might help. Um, but anyway, what we see here is the question. So go ahead, pause the video, and try to figure it out. And then, as always, we'll go over it. Okay, so the strategy for a question like this is to think about pairs of numbers that multiply together to give us 32. All right, and so then we want to take each number in the pair and see if it is one of our common square roots, right? So let me show you what I mean. So for 32, all right, so think about numbers that are multiplied together to give us 32. Now, one pair is 2 and 16. So hopefully one of these numbers has a common square root here. So we've got square root of 2 square root of 16. So unfortunately, square root of 2 is not on our list. However, square root of 16 is. And we can see from our list that the square root of 16 equals 4. All right. And square root of 2, we just leave hanging here. So the idea is that we take this square root of 32, and we know that that's going to be equal to the square root of 2 times 16. Now, this little dot that I wrote here, that just means multiplication. Sometimes you'll see a dot and just know that that means multiplication. But the key is that square root of 32, we just think about two numbers that will multiply together to give us 32. And we can rewrite it then as square root of 2 times 16. And we can take it even further because we know that the square root of 16 is, is just 4. All right, and that lets us write 4 square root of 2 and A is the correct answer here. So if you want to see the written solution here from my book here, here's the written solution, or at least the first part of it. So you can pause the video if you'd like to, and you can read this, add anything you want to your notes. And here's the second part of that written solution. So if you'd like to, you can pause the video, take as much time as you need to, uh, but we're gonna move on now to the next question. All right, the next question on our quiz here, and again, don't worry about the numbers, because I'm Pulling this question and the next couple questions you'll see out of my book. So the numbers are, are strange. They don't correspond to the numbers of the quiz here. But the question says, answer without using a calculator, 563 plus 124. So go ahead, pause the video, and try this one out. So hopefully with this question here, this is one that hopefully most people will get right. And I included this question on this quiz for two reasons. Number one, because I know that there's probably some people out there that are feeling confused or are feeling like they're not understanding many of these questions or like they're not getting a lot of the questions right on this quiz. And so I put this question in here because I don't want anyone to feel demoralized or broken down or beat down by these questions. I know it might feel that way. Um, some of them that are a little bit harder than what you're used to. Uh, so I put this question in here. Hopefully this will be one that you'll be able to get right. So that's number one. Um, and number two, the second reason is because this is a fundamental skill, just knowing how to add numbers like this. If you've been studying your math for a little while, then hopefully this is not very hard for you. But if it is, then don't worry. You know, you got to start somewhere. But basically, all you do for a question like this is you just line them up, and you would do 3 plus 4, which is 7. Then 6 plus 2, which gives us 8. 
5 plus 1 is 6, and the answer is C here, 687. And this is probably more of a simple question. This is probably simpler than the questions you'll get on the GED test. But again, I just put this in here because this is a basic skill to have, and so I don't want to overlook a basic skill if you're not really up to speed yet on your math fundamentals if you're just starting with basic math and I want to put this one in here and also just really to say thank you for sticking with me so far into the video and I want you to really don't go anywhere stay with me here because I know this can be tedious I know this can be boring here but but you're really doing an excellent job if you made it this far into the video most people didn't make it this far into the video and just the fact that you have it really shows that you're really dedicated to making progress on the GED test and for the next couple questions here I'm going to be giving you not just the solutions on screen here, but they're going to have written solutions too because they're coming out of my book. So I'm going to put those written solutions up on the screen here. And for people who either can't afford a textbook or, you know, just like to see things in writing, I'm going to put those notes up on the screen alongside as I've already been doing throughout the video. But just wanted to state that, you know, I just really want to say thank you so much for being here watching this video. So hopefully this was a simple question for you if anyone's out there is feeling a little demoralized or, you know, I certainly don't want you to come away from this video feeling more confused uh, or more stuck. So keep at it. Uh, you're really doing a great job by being here and that you made it this far into the video. So let's keep going here. And, you know, I really hope the rest of this video helps you even more with passing the GED test. So let me get the written explanation up here if anyone wants to see that. So here's the first part. And you know the drill, you can pause the video, take your time with this. And let me scroll down, let me get the second part here. So here's the second part of the written solution. And now let's go on to the next question. Okay, so the next question for the quiz says, without using a calculator, determine which number below is equal to the fraction seven over four. So pause the video, try this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so Let's go over this question. And so this is one of those questions that it's kind of like either you know it or you don't. You either know how to do it or you don't, I should say. But basically, what I want you to recognize is that this fraction is what we call an improper fraction. And we know that because the top number of the fraction, which is the 7, is bigger than the bottom number. So any fraction where the top number is bigger than the bottom number, that is called an improper fraction. And we can always convert an improper fraction into what's called a mixed number. So the way that we do that is we want to take 4 and we want to multiply it by some number that is going to give us a number that's close to 7, but it has to be less than 7. All right, so let's use 1, right? So 4 times 1, all right, uh, we can't use two here because if we do four times two, that's gonna give us eight, which is bigger than seven. So that's why we have to stick with one. So we wanna do four times one, that gives us four. All right, and then you would take four and you'd say, well, what can I add to that to get to seven? And the answer is three. All right, so again, all I'm doing here is I'm just taking this improper fraction, I'm converting it to a mixed number. So. That's a fundamental skill, and if you're having trouble with that, then I'd really recommend you watch my video on fractions, which I'll put a link to down below. But we're starting out, we're just taking this improper fraction, converting it into a mixed number. And so now the next thing that you have to understand is that three over four, that's just equal to 0.75, right? And so that's why we get 1.75. And so there's some fraction values like three over four is one of them that's equal to 0.75. And there's some that you just want to memorize, which I'll show you a couple of the most important ones in just a second here. Um, but you know, I just want to say that again, this is one of those questions. It's kind of like either you know how to do it or you don't. And if you had trouble with this question, then don't worry about it. I try to include in this in these quizzes here um, a mix of questions that are going to be challenging and also questions that aren't going to be too hard for some people. So some for some people, a question like this would be easy. For some people, a question like this would be hard. So I just hopefully, you know, you just have, I want you to kind of have the mindset where well, every question that you're not getting right, you're learning, right? So every single time you don't get a question right, I just want you to just listen to the explanation and hopefully understand how to get questions like that right in the future because it's not about just this one question or understanding any one question, right? It's about the thought process behind solving the questions because you're not gonna get this exact question on the test, right? You might get something similar to this question. And so that's why, you know, don't obsess or stress out too much about getting any one question right when you're practicing. Just try to understand if you're confused and you can't get the question right on your own, 
just try to understand how the solution you know makes sense after I explain it just try to understand the thought process behind solving the questions because that's going to help you so much more when you get to the real test. So that's the end of my little pep talk here for this question. So let me show you some other uh, what I call fraction to decimal equivalent values that you should memorize for the test. And I'll also show you the written solution for this question as well. But don't feel bad if you didn't get this one. Um, this is kind of a tricky question. If you've never reviewed fractions and decimals, if you didn't get that far in your studying, this might have been tricky for you. So here are my written notes, and again, this should go without saying, but take your time by all means, pause the video, read these, and uh, so one thing I didn't note is that the, the top number in a fraction is always called the numerator, the bottom number is called the denominator, so I note that here in the written solution. Um, I also, I define proper fractions and improper fractions here for you, and then so let me scroll down here to the next part, so I talk about mixed numbers. So here again, you can pause the video and you can read through this more if you'd like to, you don't have to. Um, and then we keep going here. So here's the, the next part of the solution. So you could pause the video again and get this in here. Um, but here are some of those values I was talking about. So here I have 1 fourth that equals 0.25, 2 fourths equals 0.5, 3 fourths equals 0.75, and 4 over 4 equals 1. And in my book here, I just write about a good way to think about this is to think about money here, right? So if you've got one quarter, you have 25 cents. So one out of four equals 0.25. If you have two quarters, you have 50 cents or two out of four, which equals 0.5. And if you have three quarters, that's 75 cents or three fourths of 0.75. And then four quarters is $1. So four out of four equals one. And then I have a, an alternative explanation here too. So again, take your time, rewind the video, pause the video. And if you wanna get these notes, if not, just keep, well, let's just keep rolling in and we'll go on to the next question. Okay, question number 74. Just kidding, it's not really 74. You probably thought there's no way I was gonna make that joke twice in the same video, but I did anyway, so. Um, anyway, here we go. We're on up to the next question here and answer without using a calculator 0 0.04 times 0 0.002. So go ahead and figure this out. And so I like second chances and I'm sure you do too. Second chances are always good. And I say that because earlier in the video we had a similar question to this and I'm sure there's someone out there that got that question wrong, but learned from it and is now able to get a question like this right. So that's why I put this question in here. It's a little bit of a different take on something we already did. So pause the video, try it out, and hey, if you got the earlier multiplication question wrong, now's an awesome chance to try again for redemption. Okay, so for a question like this, you could write one number on top of the other, but that's actually not really necessary here. The fast way to do this, and I'm talking lightning fast, all we wanna do is we wanna look at the four and the two, and just think about it like this. Just think, what's four times two? And that's a basic times table, and that is eight. So we get eight, so let me put an eight down here, and now let's look at our decimal points. So we've got this right here, 0 0.04. Let's count the digits that are to the right of that decimal point. So we've got two digits, right? We've got zero and four, so that's two digits. We do the same thing over here. We've got zero, 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 which gives us five digits. So what that tells us, so five in total, right? We've got one, two, three, four, five. So we've got five digits to the right of the decimal points. So we know that our answer must have five digits in a total. All right, so we can put a decimal here and we see that if we put four zeros here, right? One, two, three, four, five, the fifth digit being the eight here, right? That is going to give us five digits total, right? Let me count those again. Five digits total to the right of the decimal point. One, two, three, four, five. Just like up here in our additional multi in our original multiplication, we have one, two, three, four, five to the right of our decimal points. So E is the correct answer here. So here's the written solution for that question. And if you are at all confused with that question, then I'd recommend you pause the video, take your time and read this explanation and hopefully it'll make more sense to you. Okay, next question. Answer without using a calculator. If Donna maintains an average speed of 60 miles per hour, how many minutes will it take her to drive 100 miles? So you know the drill, this should go without saying at this point, go ahead, pause the video, try it out, and then we'll go over how to do it. 
Okay, so here, what I want you to realize here is that we want to find an answer in minutes. So we're given she's going to drive 100 miles. So we'll start with our 100 miles. And this is like a conversion type of problem here. So what you have to understand here is that 60 miles per hour, miles per hour is just a rate. So miles per hour, we can just write that as, uh, we can write it as either 60 over one hour or as one hour over 60 miles. So in this case, since we've got 100 miles here, we'll want to write it so that we have one hour over 60 miles. All right, and the reason is because then our miles are gonna cancel out, right? So we wanna cancel out the miles, right? And if we wrote it the other way, if we wrote it 60 over one hour, then the units wouldn't cancel out here. But the reason that they cancel out is because we're basically dividing miles by miles and they'll cancel out here. So now we can use the zero trick so we can cancel a zero out from 100 and from 60. So essentially what we're gonna be left with here is 10 over six hours, all right? And we can simplify this down even further because these are both even numbers here. So we could just divide them both by two. So what's 10 divided by two? 10 divided by two gives us five. What about six divided by two? Six divided by two gives us three. So we'll have five over three hours, okay? But the problem is asking us about minutes. So now what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to take this five over three hours and somehow we're gonna have to convert that into minutes. So think about it, how many hours or, or I should say how many minutes are in one hour? Well, we know that, or hopefully you know that there are 60 minutes per one hour. Right, so we're gonna take this conversion factor here and we're gonna set it up so that we can cancel these hours out. So we'll start with our five over three hours and we've got the 60 minutes uh, per one hour, right? And so we wanna multiply it so that the units cancel. So we're gonna put our one hour down here on the bottom and we're going to put our 60 minutes on the top here. Okay, and so what I want you to see here is that the hours are gonna cancel out. Hours, hours cancel out. So now we have five over three times 60. Now, what about, what can we simplify here? Well, we could do 60 divided by three, right? And what's that gonna give us? Well, it's gonna give us 20, right? And one way to think about that is if you do six divided by three, that just gives us two, but it's not six, it's 60. Okay, so that's why it would be 20. So we would then be left with five times 20. Okay, and five times 20, you can think of it this way, you can think about, think about it like five times two, which is 10, but since it's not five times two, it's five times 20, so you would need to add that extra zero down here. And remember that the units are just minutes, right? Now, that's not the only way to think about this question, right? You could have thought about it a couple other ways. Um, like for example, when you were at this step right here where it was five over three times 60, you know, you could have done something like this. You could have just done, done it like 60 times five and you could have tried to do this math. You could have said five times zero is zero five times six is 30, so you have 300. Then you could have remembered that you had this three, so then you could have thought about it like 300 divided by three. You know, you could have done something like that and you could have figured out that that is equal to 100 minutes. So like with many different types of math problems, there's not just one way to do it, um, but this is just how in this question uh, we would get 100 minutes. So there's a couple different ways to get the same answer. Tommy. Hey everybody, this is my cat Tommy, for those that are new here. Uh, my cat often stars in some of my videos. Sometimes I plan to get him in some of the shots and sometimes he just jumps in like he did there, but that's Tommy, everybody. Okay, question 119 says, answer without a calculator. Square root of 12 plus square root of 27. All right, so go ahead and try to figure this out and then we'll go over it. 
All right, so this question here, what we want to do is we want to break this square root of 12 and square root of 27 up into numbers that are going to be easier to work with. And by easier to work with, I want us to look at numbers that are going to have what I called common square roots earlier in the video. So let's think about numbers that will multiply together to give us 12, right? Would be 3 and 4. Right, that's a pretty obvious one. And if we think about it, remember that the square root of four is two. So four is uh, gonna be a great number to use here. So let's put those under the square root. So we know that three times four is going to be uh, equal to 12. So we have three times four here. So let's do the same thing now with 27, right? So let's think of numbers that'll multiply together to give us 27 now. So what about three? and 9. Now recall that the square root of 9 is 3, so 9 is on our common square roots list, right? And, and what I mean by that again is that if you take the square root of 9, it's 3, it gives us a really nice number. Unlike 3, if we try to take the square root of 3, it's going to give us a really strange number. So we can rewrite the square root of 27 as 3 times 9, right? And so since we know that the square root of 4 is 2, we can take this term right here and just rewrite it as 2 square root of 3. And since we know that the square root of 9 is 3, we can take this term here and rewrite it as 3 times the square root of 3. All right, so now what we can do is we can look at the 2 and look at the 3 and we can add them, so two plus three is five, and we just keep the square root of three right where it is, right like it is, and the answer here is C, five square root of three. So as always, here is that written solution to the question. So your next step now is to go quiz yourself on some more GED practice questions if you'd like to by heading over to my GED math quiz video and I'll show you some other types of questions that you can expect on the GED test. Thank you so much for watching. Great luck on your test. I really hope it works out well for you.